a recent physician in training whose wife was also a physician, called out noise in his backyard, goes out to see what's going on, and the next thing uh, his wife knows, she hears a gunshot. She goes back out to their backyard where apparently there were some homeless encampment type of a thing going on. Uh, she finds him there in a pool of blood and uh, we get called in. A guy with everything to live for that, I mean, these are the type of events that, that occur that never should occur, but sadly do occur. And uh, they were, you know, this is a couple that was trying to start a family together, trying to build their future. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I've got a very special guest, Dr. Martin Bastuba. He is a fellowship trained urologist practicing down in San Diego. And his fellowship training and focus is on male infertility and sexual dysfunction. Uh, one of the interesting things that he does is post-mortem sperm retrievals. And so that's what I'm really excited to have the chance to kind of talk to him about today. So, uh, Dr. Bastuba, why don't you tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Dr. Chan, for the nice introduction. Yeah, so I'm just a simple guy from Detroit, Michigan, that uh, got into medicine and fell in love with fertility. And I've been in San Diego area now for nearly 30 years. My practice is largely doing sexual dysfunction and reproductive medicine of all sorts, sperm retrievals and such on living patients. But a number of years ago, I attended a scientific meeting, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and I heard a very interesting panel discussion about PMSR, post-mortem sperm retrievals. Uh, here in San Diego, we have a, a large military uh, base, uh, and there were some people who had done heroic things in foreign countries and then came back to the U.S. and maybe did some not-so-smart things and ended up passing at a young age with wives and families that were so distraught. And I started getting calls from them and others, but that's my was the the first real thing was uh, military people, who uh, young people who had passed away, they were trying to start a family together, and I was being called with a request, uh, could I retrieve some sperm for them, and that is post mortem sperm retrieval. That's what it entails uh, in large part. Can, can you kind of run me through the process of maybe what what does it look like uh, when you get that phone call from somebody um, to go obtain it? This is a known uh, spousal life partner. Uh, that's one requirement. Uh, typically they are who's calling or maybe a very close family member is calling. Uh, there is more knowledge about it in the general public, which is helping for people to even realize that this is a possibility. So we field that call, and the first thing we want to know is uh, how long has the uh, person been deceased? Uh, how did things occur to get some idea of the possibility uh, if there may still be viable sperm? Then we also want to know, you know, was there an intent from the deceased to start a family with their partner? And that is a very important aspect of things that we want to pay respect to that person and make sure that it was their intent. Furthermore, we want to make sure that it was known not only to their partner, their life partner, but also to their family members. We want to make sure that the parents on both sides were aware of this, that they are supportive of this, and other family members are supportive of this. We want this to be an agreed upon situation where everyone uh, is in agreement that that was the plan, that that was the wish, and then we are more off to the races in terms of the logistics of actually making things happen once we've worked through the ethics. Can you talk a little bit about uh, logistically uh, what happens 
uh, when you're retrieving it and kind of where does the tissue end up? Now we service all of California. Uh, it's not unusual for me to hop on a plane and fly to San Jose. Did that a couple, three times last year. Uh, for whatever reason, San Jose was uh, calling. Uh, but when we get the call, we are immediately trying to, again, once we've worked out the ethics, now it's the, the logistics in terms of how are we going to get tissue. And so this has been a operation out of my practices. We have various practices, my private uh, practice, male fertility specialist. Then we also have Fertility Center of California, which would do the tissue processing, extracting the sperm. And once we have the sperm extracted, then it would be transferred to the Family Fertility Cryobank. But wait, there's more. We now have created uh, the uh, PMSR network, Postmortem Sperm Retrieval Network, which is a network of California physicians that are on board, know how to do a sperm retrieval, and can make things happen more readily. And we're expanding that network to try to cover all of California in, in a pretty expedient fashion. We like to try to retrieve sperm within 24 hours if possible, but the reality is, depending on the conditions, we've uh, retrieved sperm up to 72 hours after death so that we, uh, we have some leeway there, especially depending on how the body, uh, again, how things occurred and how the body has been uh, taken care of since the passing has occurred. And I imagine this must be a pretty emotional kind of situation. Um, how do you usually find the family kind of reacts to, to this whole process? You know, Robert, I must say that people, when they hear about this from the outside, they're like, wait a minute, what are they doing here? Are they taking advantage of people? Uh, you know, somebody when they're weak. And I, I must say, in my experience, it is precisely and exactly the opposite. These are people who have had something, generally something very traumatic occur. We are the one bright spot in the whole situation. We are the only hope that they have in what is a, a very traumatic situation. And, and so, yes, they oftentimes are very challenged emotionally. And again, a lot of times there's another family member, a sister, a brother, who is, is help guiding things through. Uh, we, we have the paperwork fairly well worked out though, so that it is all pretty easy for things to happen. And another part of the ethics of this is, we require a year moratorium before the tissue can be accessed to allow for the, the loved one to have time to regain their composure, to be able to, to come to some terms from the, the loss of their loved one before we allow access to use the tissue. And furthermore, we also require that they are evaluated by a psychologist or another trained professional to be able to evaluate them and make sure that they've had adequate grieving, that they, they are of sound mind and that they're making a sound decision and not just something that is uh, in response to trauma and not well thought out. So we, we all these things are in place. Now, if the female uh, is 37 years of age or more, we will consider release of the tissue earlier, but again, they're still gonna need clearance from a trained professional to say that yes, they are of sound mind, that, they're, that they've thought things through, and they're not just doing this as a reflex move uh, uh, from emotion. Uh, I guess the other thing that I would bring up are there's, we have three uh, live births uh, from stored tissue over the years. I've been doing this now, I should say we have been doing this as a team now for probably about 20 years. Uh, we have three live births. It's not that usual that the tissue is ever accessed. 
but it is universal that the family is very thankful that, that this hope was given to them. Uh, I find it to be a healing tool for someone that feels everything has been removed from them. They still have a thread of hope left. Uh, and I think that alone is healing to them and, and helps them with their grieving. So that, uh, but occasionally there is the thought that after the dust has settled, that yes, they do want to pursue fertility. And I guess the, the, the good news there is fertility is possible. Now it requires in vitro fertilization, test tube baby in Guy Talk. This is uh, where the sperm are injected into eggs that have been removed from a female, so it's done outside the body. In vitro means in glass, so it's in a glass petri dish outside the body. And so pregnancies can occur. There is some expense to doing in vitro that is not covered at time of the procedure, because again, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the time the tissues are not used. But when it is uh, needed, it, it can be successful for people. And, and in vitro fertilization has a very high success rate, especially it's much more dependent than on egg health than it is on the sperm. As long as we have movement in the sperm when we freeze it, it will likely thaw well and work well with in vitro fertilization. Uh, anything else you want to share that you think might be interesting or important to know about? Yep, it can be done and I think should be done uh, if the circumstances are correct and uh, you know if we feel that it's appropriate. We do turn down some cases. We have you know parents that just want us to do it uh, and there the ethics is that you know did their child, was that their wish that their parents would create a family without their consent, without their knowledge, and I can't in good faith say that that I would would agree with that. So uh, others would, they'll retrieve anything, but we, we try to follow the guidelines uh, that were set down by Cornell a number of years ago, and, and I think are very appropriate still. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on and just kind of bringing this awareness. I think for most people, they don't even, they don't even know that something like this or this service exists. So um, this is great.